that we've encountered in the process of migrating data or changing systems. And this is just an outline of them, and I'll elaborate on each of these. First is interfaces. Second is competing clinical versus migration uses. The third is phase out of the old hardware. And I'll start with the interface problem. All packs to other information system and imaging equipment interfaces will at least have to be tested. And an important thing here is don't forget that there may be a new round of interface license fees involved. If you change vendors, for example, if I change packs but keep my wrists, the wrist vendor may say, well, that's a new system, that's a new interface that has to be coded up, and therefore there's a new license fee involved. It's important to consider that when you're budgeting for data migration, a look at the potential costs of interface software license fees. Now what about clinical use versus migration? This was one of the problems that our change of vendors engendered, and that is the new vendor's estimate of the time to migrate the database assumed that they could just use the old database and the server 100% of the time. But of course, we're still using the system clinically. We don't have the new system yet. So you're likely still using it and often 24 hours, seven days a week. So you cannot let migration run all the time. What about phasing out of old hardware? Well, we had planned on a particular time frame for changing our systems out and the goal was missed. And you might ask, well, why is that a problem? Delays usually mean a little bit of cost here and there or a little bit later getting started. But in fact, it can be more of a problem. Now, missing a changeover schedule. We knew in our case that our old PAC system was in need of expansion. That is, we were getting pretty close to what's known as the watershed or the high water mark for a storage device. And we're running out of space, basically, at which point uh, you would normally add more storage. That was one of the things that we were facing. The other is that we had some idea that parts were likely to fail completely. And you might ask, well, how do you know that? Well, the archives that we were using were mechanical jukeboxes, mechanical optical disc jukeboxes. And we were starting to see mechanical failures at an increasing frequency. Typically, what would happen is the robot that selects the disc would get stuck and it would require some manual intervention to get it to move. And until that time, we couldn't retrieve data. And this kind of problem we were seeing with an increasing frequency. So we had a hint that this might result in a permanent failure at some point. We didn't fix the problems because according to the schedule that we had, we were supposed to have our new system in place before we expected these problems to become critical. And when the target date was missed, the problem is that those expected failures started to occur. And this brings up another problem in data migration or system change. And that is, who handles the existing system problems during a changeover? If you think about it, the old system vendor was no longer under contract for service. And the new system vendor was certainly not enthusiastic about paying for expanding a system that wasn't theirs and repairing a system that they were going to replace. And for us, it took several months of negotiation with both vendors to get the situation resolved. Now, it wasn't that they were irresponsible and didn't stop us from doing our work, but to figure out how this was all going to get paid for turned out to be an interesting problem. So what would we recommend, or what would I recommend based on our experience? First off, get a prenuptial agreement from your PAX vendor. And this may sound funny, it's the kind of thing people do before they get married nowadays, but in fact, you can take the same concepts and apply them to a relationship with a new system vendor. You could also consider a vendor-independent storage solution. And what does a vendor-independent storage solution do? Well, you change the other parts of your pack. So you change the workstations and you change the displays of various kinds and maybe the interfaces to the imaging equipment, but you don't have to change the storage system. The database and data need relatively minor changes, typically remapping of the database tables. Now, this does require that the vendor independent storage solution be able to uh, do this kind of remapping or provide a fairly straightforward SQL interface for doing this. But the idea is that you do not have to then migrate all of the data that's stored in the physical storage system. 
And it does depend on DICOM. The reason we say it depends on DICOM is because if the stuff is stored in DICOM files, those are understood by the new system as well as the old system, and uh, it makes it a lot easier to do the migration. The only thing you would have to look at is how those DICOM elements are mapped into the database so they can be located. Now, vendor independent storage solutions certainly are not going to help you with the change in vendors that you currently face unless you were smart enough to think of it before you bought your first packs. And since these things have been available relatively recently, it's unlikely that you're going to have that in place. Vendors may also not like the idea, but in my experience, this attitude seems to be changing and a number of vendors are now offering a true DICOM archive with the goal of making any migration easier. It also benefits the vendors in that it makes it somewhat simpler for them to change their own systems to update and change their systems without having to migrate data within their own product line. Now what about time estimates? This is one of the things that we would strongly recommend is that you want realistic estimates of how long it's going to take to do these things. How much of the day can you give to the database and give the database and servers over to migration? If you've got a busy practice that runs 24 hours and 7 days a week, it's going to be very difficult to give over more than little slots of time to do this. Determine how seriously background migration would impact clinical operation. It may be feasible, for example, to steal some idle time on occasion to do migrate a few studies but you need to look at how that would potentially impact clinical operation if things start to get busy again in the middle of the time the vendor is using to migrate the data. Because remember the server is trying to do more than one thing here. It's trying to serve up the studies that are being requested for clinical use, but it's also being asked to serve up studies to be migrated to a new database. And so you're competing for the resources of the storage system and that's what's uh, causing potential problems. Be careful how migration software reacts to errors. This is one thing that I've seen in multiple sites, and that is you have to be careful that the migration software, if it encounters an error, for example, one of those problem studies that I mentioned that's got a mismatch in patient name and medical record number, you don't want it to lock up and stop there and not do anything until it's cleared. This is not an unusual problem. I see it even within a PAC system that if a system encounters an error rather than skipping a record and going to the next one, it sits there and waits until the problem is cleared typically by a human operator. So this is something to watch out for, that you don't want software that's going to lock up your system if it encounters problems in the database. Now based on our experience, what would I recommend? Well, be prepared for failures of your old system before you complete the changeover. Don't count on reusing old PAX hardware. These two things are semi-related because you wouldn't want to reuse hardware if it was failing, but you also have to account for potential failures of your system before you uh, make the complete changeover. And the reason I say don't count on reusing old PAX hardware is it's likely obsolete. I'm sure you've all had the experience of buying a new laptop or a desktop computer and Literally by the time you get it home, you see an announcement that there's a new version of the operating system or there's a faster graphics card or the next bump up in speed of the CPU. So hardware turns over very, very quickly. So if you're planning on reusing the old hardware, uh, it may be, a, may be a futile exercise. Besides, you may need that hardware to run your old system in parallel. Remember that the changeover, particularly if your new vendor is going to be using a new system, you won't be able to view the studies on it yet, and so you may have to run the old system in parallel to get to some of the old studies as well as the current ones. And of course, you may not own the hardware in the first place if you had a lease arrangement for the packs instead of an outright capital purchase. Now, what about old system failures? This I mentioned is a problem that we had with the missed changeover date. In the case of ultrasound, one of the unfortunate things that we discovered was that our database backup for the old system wasn't working. And the problem is that we didn't discover this until the old system failed and the database was completely lost. And what that meant is I had about 1.4 terabytes of ultrasound studies that were effectively orphans because the database that knew on which disk the study was located was gone. And the vendor said, well, we can rebuild the database, but it meant reading every file off of every one of those disks. There were about 1,400 of them, and the process would have taken about a year and a half. So it really wasn't worth it for us to do. In the meantime, one of our vendors developed a small set of software that would allow us to retrieve those studies ad hoc. And that's what we've been doing since.
So just because you're putting in a new system does not mean you can ignore maintenance and checking of the backups on your old system. If you're still using it, you have to treat it like it's still your primary system. A little bit more about this prenuptial agreement. Consider it an ounce of prevention. You want guaranteed access to the database and the data. If the vendor's going out of business, you want the database schema before they shut down. The database schema are the details of the way the various linkages between elements of the SQL tables are constructed. You need to know that if you're going to try to access the data efficiently. You also need details of all the inter-system interfaces, both DICOM and HL7 messages, and what the content is. If there are DICOM objects that have proprietary fields in them, what we call shadow groups and elements, you would like to know how those are handled by the vendors before they change systems, because in some cases, some of those shadow group elements are relied on by the vendor for some of their functionality. It's important to know that before you change vendors or your new system may not be able to reproduce all of the functionality of your old system. What other kinds of things should this prenuptial agreement cover? Well, you'd like an option to continue service contracts with your present vendor on a month-by-month -month basis, though you might want to apply some cost constraints to that because, again, you may potentially miss target dates for a changeover, and if that happens, you don't want to be without a service contract so you may want to negotiate what happens if the dates are missed. Service should be on the same terms as during your system active life. You certainly don't want to be changed from a 24-hour, 7-day-a-week support to a 12-hour, 5-day-a-week support if you're still using the system for critical clinical applications. Guaranteed engineering support for the transition. That is, you want to be sure that the new vendor is willing to work with the old vendor, and as simple as that sounds, uh, it can often be difficult. The vendors may not want to work with each other because they are competitors, although generally in our experience we've found that the vendors are actually quite good about cooperating when their systems are being changed. Now, it's not expected that any of these things is going to be free, but you may want to negotiate a schedule of charges for these things. Now, this is not the same kind of thing that you would think of when you're buying a PAX, but this is the kind of thing you do have to think about for potential PAX changes. So it makes sense to negotiate a schedule of charges for such work uh, so that uh, you'd be prepared if you have to do this.